John McAfee, pioneer in the cybersecurity industry, the founder of the software company McAfee Associates, now CEO of MGT Capital Investments. Good evening. Welcome to Romania. Well, thank you for inviting me. Um, Mr. McAfee, there are all these debates and you know headlines in today's media about cybersecurity hacks, information uh, security, and so on. So, before diving into our discussions, how would you describe the sense of security in the digital world in 2017? How would I describe the sense of security? Well, we have none. There is no security whatsoever. Uh, I think this is the the problem that cybersecurity professionals like myself face every day. Um, you know, I see people walking around, everyone has their phones out. Uh, while you are watching your phone, your phone is watching you. This is just a fact of life. Uh, the operating system is designed specifically to watch you, listen to you, find out where you are in order to help you. It needs to know who your friends are. Um, it needs to know what you're saying in your text messages. Um, it needs to listen to you sometimes. And so you're looking at your phone and you have all of these facilities, but it is the world's greatest spy device, designed as a spy device. Now, there's nothing wrong with that as long as the person spying on you is spying on you for benign reasons, meaning maybe they just want to sell you something. Uh, they notice that uh, you're uh, you just mentioned to someone that you were hungry and you didn't know where you are and there's uh, a Chinese or a Japanese restaurant nearby and they know you like Japanese and Chinese food because you frequently go there. And they say, oh, by the way, uh, there's a Japanese restaurant right around the corner. That's cool. I can choose to say no. But hackers use those same facilities. They are built into the operating system. So. If a hacker gets access to those facilities, they may choose to empty my bank account without my permission or knowledge, uh, or to steal my identity, or to start charging things on my credit cards, or if I have a Bitcoin wallet or an Ethereum wallet, they can empty my wallets. That's the problem that we have, and that's just on the individual level. <clears throat> on the corporate level, it's horrific because it, the problem is magnified by the number of people within the corporation. And on the nation state level, it's, it's even more horrific because the nation states have been spending years and, and literally billions of dollars weaponizing software to the point that almost every developed nation has the ability to press a button and destroy the power grid in any other nation. The, the, this is the facts. This is not science fiction. This is not uh, me being paranoid. I mean, perhaps I am paranoid, but, but what I just told you is real, nevertheless. So you are speaking about uh, various problems, right? What, what's the solution? Well, actually, I'm not even talking about virus problems anymore. I think, I think the antivirus paradigm is, is no longer functional. It doesn't work. I said this 10 years ago, and, and I'm the person who invented it. So I, I, people should listen. I mean, if I invented it and I, I built the first antivirus company, viruses are not the problem. Um, by the time hackers have planted malware in your system, it's way too late. The hackers spend weeks, months, or sometimes years sniffing around in your system, taking what they want before they even plant malware. And sometimes they don't, I mean, un unless you have you're trying to ransom something, like a hospital, take all their data and encrypt it, and say for $100,000 you can have it back. You'll need malware at that point, but by then it's too late. Because by the time you've found the malware, the malware has already done the damage. See, this is the problem. It's a reactive paradigm, and we have to become proactive. Um, How do we do this? Well, uh, from a technological standpoint, you know, if, if I'm personally, developing products that focus on identifying the hacker, not the malware. Uh, by the time the malware is there, as I said, it's too late. So, but you can find the presence of a hacker in your system so easily. And every hacker has to go through certain steps in order to break into any system and do damage. The first thing they have to do is get through the firewall. 
after they've gotten through, the, and, and all firewalls have holes. It, it's impossible to build a firewall that can keep out all hackers. It just can't be done. They have to get through the firewall, and then they have to find out where they are. And so what's on this net? So they sniff every device on the network. Well, that's, that's an anomaly. That's behavior which is not normal. I mean, who does that? Nobody. Um, so <coughs> just a, a very simple hardware box with very simple software would be able to at least identify that much. If you're watching all the traffic on the network and you see, well, oh, someone just came in through port 80, well, that itself is strange. No one comes in through that port, but they did. And then they sniffed the refrigerator or whoever is, whatever is connected, if it's the Internet of Things, remember, you might have a refrigerator on your network. The refrigerator, everybody's workstation, the, um, uh, the main server, and all the honeypots in my device. Well, th that's crazy. So within a matter of seconds, uh, I can then send um, an email or a text message to the CIO and, and say, uh, a hacker just came in, or what looks like a hacker. And that's only one of the types of things that hackers do. There are many thousands. So, you know, so, and, and I'm not the only person working on this. There are, you know, others that see the, the insanity of what we're doing and are doing similar things. So uh, we have a device coming out in just a couple of months called Sentinel that will um, identify within a matter of seconds. Now, we're not going to do anything about it. That's your job as the CIO or as the network manager. We can say there's a hacker in the system that came in through port 80. This is what they're doing. We will continue to monitor them. But you have to make some decisions as the human being. What do you do? You could call the authorities. I mean, I wouldn't advise that because your, your business will be shut down virtually because the, the, uh, the authorities will be running around and your employers are going to be watching and no one's going to be working. You might just simply shut down port 80 and forget it. Maybe you'll come in through another port later. We don't know. If so, my box Sentinel will tell you about it. So isn't that more sane? Because we, it's the hackers that are doing the damage, not the, not the software they've created. The, the hackers create that software. It's the hackers we must concern ourselves with. We've, we've, been, we've been fighting the end product. Hackers have created rather than the hacker himself or herself. So the proactive approach, and, and, and there are many products that we're working on that, that do the same thing, where we're dealing with the human element rather than the product of what the human has created. Where does education stand in yes. this whole e equation? Yeah, well, I, I think the first thing, everybody in this room should educate yourself about these little devices everyone is holding up and carrying, because they truly are spy devices. You, you have people, I mean, I've, I've even heard people at Google say that if you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to fear. Well, I've never heard anything crazier. I and mean, who, who, who among us has nothing to hide? I'm serious. It's not, do you have something to hide, but what is it that you're trying to hide and from whom? Think about this. Everybody, everyone exercises a different degree of privacy hundreds or sometimes thousands of times per day. I just met you. I'm not likely right now, especially with everybody watching, to tell you the intimate details of my life. It's like if I, I go to this, the store and buy some, some nice Romanian beer, I don't tell the clerk what I did last night when, in uh, my private hours. No. We have very restricted lines of conversation. The weather, politics maybe, the price of potatoes. And that's, and that's it. You meet a casual acquaintance that you see every week, you might divulge more. Uh, maybe you have a health problem you want to talk to him about. Uh, a good friend, you might divulge almost everything. And to your spouse, to your wife, or to your husband, you might tell them everything. Unless maybe you're, you're sleeping with your wife's sister, in which case you might choose not. So, do, you, do you see what I'm saying? So that if everybody knew everything about everyone else, we would have chaos in the streets, beginning with a rash of people shooting their spouses. So. It, 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 it's, it's insane to say, if you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to fear. We are humans. We are living in an imperfect world. You know, we, we each have 
love and compassion and, and joy and, and hope and grace. And at the same time, we have greed and anger and hostility and jealousy. And we're a mixed bag. So if you want all of, all of that negative known too, no, we can't. Society has created privacy as the foundation stone of a harmonious world. And if we lose that, we will lose the harmony. What do you think about all these emerging technologies that are now uh, being used by giant companies in the industry? And I'm, I'm speaking about, for example, cloud storage or uh, all those data mining uh, technologies. Yes. Uh, how long will these last as secure technologies, what do you think? Uh, they're, not secure. they're not secure now. I mean, you know, I'm here to speak at uh, Brock, uh, Brock Pierce's brainchild, uh, d 10 um, on, on a cryptocurrency. Um, and cryptocurrency, people say, well, how secure is Bitcoin? I go, what side do you want to look at? If you want to look at the blockchain, I think it's extremely secure. It's a mathematical principle that allows you to validate with absolute certainty uh, a source and destination for any transaction. That's very powerful. On the other hand, I see people who put wallets on their smartphones. Now, now, something that you may not know is that over half of all smartphones, both uh, iOS and Android, are infected with keystroke logging software. This is a known fact. Every pornography site in the world, if you have ever, I'm sure nobody here has ever looked at pornography, but if you have, if there's a rare, a rare exception, then... Um, you have keystroke locking software. How do you think they make their money? See, this is, this is the issue. Um, it costs millions of dollars to maintain these massive databases and have the bandwidth to, to disperse this pornography. And yet, you don't pay. Yes, you're paying. The instant you visit the site, if you have an Android, for example, the site runs a JavaScript which sets the download unauthorized application flag. The very first video that you watch, you now, because that's a click through, you clicked, you did something. You said, yes, oh, good, that's yes, I'll do that. Um, downloads, first and foremost, a remote routing function. If it's an iPhone, uh, a remote jailbreaking program. All can be remotely uh, rooted now. After it's rooted, they download a key, a key logger, and all this takes just a matter of seconds. And from that point on, somebody, is watching every single one of your keystrokes. Now, people pay these pornography sites for the ability to put their key logging software on your phones. Why? Well, well maybe they're a Bitcoin aficionado and they're, they're gonna see, ah, do you have a Bitcoin wallet like Mycelium or what have you? Yes. Well, this is gonna hang around until you access it and input your, your keys or your passwords and the next day, your wallet's gonna be empty. Or maybe you do online banking, all right? You have a password, you have an application. The very first time you've logged into your bank to check your balance or do anything, they go, thank you very much. And the next day, your bank balance will disappear. Now, why has this not happened to you already? Because hackers are not stupid. In order to take something, they have to download additional software. If they only take four or five hundred people's bank accounts in one day, then the next day the white hat hackers are going to say, ah, this is how they did it, everybody, you can protect yourself. No, they're going to wait until one day this year or next year and a hundred million people in one day are going to have your bank accounts eradicated. Zero balance or your identity will be stolen <coughs> or your Bitcoin wallet will be emptied. Uh, or maybe they've been watching your keystrokes to see if, you know, maybe you're saying something to a friend or a lover that maybe could compromise you. Maybe they can blackmail you. If they get lucky, you might be a U United States congressman or a senator. In which case, now not only do they have money, they have power. So this is why this is being done. And the Russian uh, um, cyber mafia and the Chinese cyber mafia are so powerful, they pay literally 
hundreds of millions of dollars to these pornography sites to allow them to access your smartphone so that at some point they can utilize that. So something to think about. Now, you said how secure are they? <laughs> well, they're not. They're not. Neither the, the, uh, uh, the alt currency wallets um, nor anything else in the cloud. Because what, what is the cloud? We haven't thought this through, people. The cloud is a place where I'm going to store data. I don't know what computer it's on or even what country it's in. I don't know who is managing it and monitoring it and controlling it. I don't know what type of security facilities you have. I know nothing. And I'm willing to put my valuable data there? No. Why would we do that? Now, if it's something I don't care about, that if you steal it, I don't care. It's, it's a list of books I read. You know, I'll just recreate it from the web. But if it's something that matters, it's like saying, we've all agreed now we have secrets, yes? yes? Well, why don't you let me keep your secrets? Why should you be burdened with having to keep your secrets? I mean, you've got too many stories to tell. Why don't you give it to me and let me manage it for you? Isn't that crazy? And yet that, that's what we're doing with our, quote, secret data. That is data we don't want to have stolen from us or taken or accessed. Did that answer your question? Yes, it did. <laughs> so as an investor, you wouldn't invest in a company that it, it's using cloud technologies? Well, well, I wouldn't say that. Because there are many ways of looking at the cloud, aren't there? I mean, as it exists now, with this, the, where we store our data is unknown. And why do we use the cloud? We use it because it makes life easy. I can access my data from anywhere and from any device, on an airplane, my smartphone, my laptop, who cares? Well, you can do the same thing by choosing where you store your data. And there are companies that are offering decentralized cloud services um, where you create the, uh, they give the software, you say, well, I want my, my my main server in the company to be where I keep all my sensitive things. You might even have your, your smartphone as a server if it's always turned on. So you get to pick and choose. And you might still use the cloud for some things because not important. It doesn't matter if people steal it or know what, what's in there. So uh, it, I'm, not, I'm not saying I wouldn't invest in it. I'm saying that um, it, would, it, would, it would have to be a new type of cloud, a cloud that you as the user have control over to, to the extent that you get to choose the location of your data. Speaking about Bitcoin, what is the most significant value of Bitcoins? What would you say? Well, I think the most significant value is, is that it, it is a new paradigm of, of, of money. Um, and it's not going to go away. It's like Pandora's box. We've opened the box. It came out. It's not going away. No matter how much governments would like it to, uh, no matter how problematic it is for banks, it's here to stay and it's growing. And the world will have to learn to adapt to it. If not Bitcoin, then one of the, uh, some other cryptocurrency, because there's, you know, hundreds of them. And I would caution people because many of these new cryptocurrencies are scams. You know, people who say, oh God, there's a lot of money to be made, let's create our own currency and name it whatever, you know, uh, the McAfee coin. Um, and let's pre-mine a million of them and sell them. But please, you know, it's, it's a license to steal. And, and they do it because people do not understand the technology behind it. And here's some other advice. If you are going to become involved in, in any kind of cryptocurrency, Bitcoin or Ethereum or Monero or whatever, you need to educate yourself. It is easy to lose your money and to become confused. <clears throat> so and these are problems that will fix themselves. The simplicity, it's difficult now because it's a new technology and we don't have the facilities to keep you as the owner of the money from hurting yourself through lack of education. We can build software to take that away. It'll just take time, a year, two years, three years, that problem will go away. Um, but banks, governments, people who, who collect taxes from income, it's a problem they're going to have to deal with. 
in one of your previous talks, you said that there are two ways of losing Bitcoin, stability and hacking. Could you please elaborate on these two aspects? Uh, through stupidity. stupidity and hacking. I, I don't use that word stupidity very much. I can't <laughs> well, believe I did. said that, but I did. Fair enough. Okay. But then I must have been talking about myself because I've lost lots playing around with cryptocurrencies um, because I'm trying to find what the problems are. You know, I let people hack me. I published the phone, my, my personal phone number in Business Insider magazine last year. And my, my wife is here. She can tell you that for weeks the phone rang nonstop 24 hours a day. However, every hacker in the world has my number now. They also have my email address. Please, try and hack me. It's not a challenge. I want to see what you're doing. I want to see the newest tech. I want to see the newest technology in data theft. And for a hacker, it's, it's a badge of honor to be able to hack a leading cybersecurity figure, well, like myself, for example. So, so that's what happens. People get into my phone. My phone has more malware on it than the entire library of, of Kaspersky Laboratories uh, because I invite everybody in. Um, and, and now I've lost your original question. It, um, so it had to do with stupidity. Stupidity and hacking. And, and hacking, yes. So it is. Stupidity meaning we blindly walk into things without thinking. Like Bitcoin. Uh, you know, you should always, at least for the next year or so, find someone who's already doing it that can advise you. Who has already has a wallet and can tell you that what's the best wallet. Who can tell you how to, to store your your money offline. It takes, it takes education and it takes a little time. Uh, and, and again, the stupidity part, you know, mostly me. I get, I get tired. I also do exchanges between Bitcoin and, and Ethereum and Ethereum and Monero, all of the alt currencies. Why? Because, because I'm, I'm looking to buy a company that, that's already doing that. And I need to understand that technology. Well, you know, I've, I've lost thousands of dollars, mostly because through my own stupidity. You know, I get tired, and when you transfer one alt currency into another, you have to have an intermediary wallet. So you have the source wallet, the intermediary wallet, and the end wallet. It's easy to get those things confused if you're doing it a lot. So that is stupidity again. Um, is there any way to secure your bitcoins once you've earned them? Yeah, absolutely. I think mine are secure. Um, but the only way to do it is offline. I mean, you can buy, you can buy devices. Um, uh, my favorite one is, is Trezor, T-R-E-Z-O-R. -E and the reason is, is because your seed keys, uh, when, you, when you first create a wallet, it gives you a thing called seed keys. It's, it's a, a list of words, random words, car, shoelace, dog, cow, whatever. Um, and these are your seed keys. Rand randomly generated to the point that there's no way anybody could ever guess them in the right order. Um, now, the ridiculousness of wallets, keep in mind that if you've been to a pornography site, someone's watching you anyway, as soon as you install the wallet, it, asks, it shows you what your seed keys are, asks you to input them so that you got it correct. Well, you just, you just gave up your wallet to any hacker who, who wants access to it. Um, What's nice about the, the Trezor device, and by the way, I have nothing to do with Trezor, I'm not, I'm not promoting it for sale, nothing, I, I just use it, <clears throat> is it has a tiny little screen that shows you the seed keys on this screen, not your smartphone, not your laptop, not your desktop, but on that device, so no hacker can access them. And then once you've put your bitcoins into the wallet, unplug it, bury it in the backyard, hide it under your mattress, whatever you want to do with it like it was real cash. So. But, but to keep the wallet on any intelligent device, whether it's your laptop, your, your uh, desktop, um, or any mobile device, that's insane. It, it will get stolen. In terms of um, cybersecurity technologies, what's your bet for the, for the future? What do you think it will be the, the, the technology of the future? It'll have to be the technology that, that looks for the, the human element that looks for the hacker rather than the malware that the hacker creates. That's the only way you can do this. Because hackers have to interface, they have to act, they have to do something in order to hack you. 
and it takes many weeks or sometimes many months uh, for them to do that. And if you can identify the hacker right up front and shut the hacker down, then they're going to go to look for easier prey. All, all of our security in the future will have to, to include that aspect of security. The hacker mindset and the hacker methodology. You speak a lot about uh, hackers. Uh, let's suppose that uh, I am a tech company. Uh, how do I deal with them? How should I approach this relationship with hackers in general? Should I work with them? Should I? Yes, hire them. That's, I keep saying it to everybody. If you don't have hackers on your, on your team, then you're lost. If, if, I'm, if I'm designing a bank vault, wouldn't I want to hire the greatest safe cracker in the world? Someone who can break into bank vaults? I want to hire that man because if I don't, then he's going to break into my safe. This, this is just a fact of life. So we, we, have to, we have to work with them and cooperate with them. We have to stop thinking that all hacking is bad. Because a hacker is, is nothing more than a person who understands every single aspect of computer technology, from the hardware all the way up to the highest level software, and loves doing that, loves living in that field, lives, eats, and breathes that. Now, you can't... You can't create a hacker. You can't send someone to Harvard or uh, to Stanford University and create a hacker. No, that's not possible. You can create a good computer scientist, but that's not the man or woman that you want to save you from hacking. You, you have to get the hackers involved. I hire nothing but hackers. My friends are all hackers. Um, you know, I, I want to know the hacker mindset, else I cannot help you. I can't do anything to create products or services to keep you secure if I don't understand my enemy. And just because they're hackers does not mean they have to be the enemy. Okay. There, there are white hackers as well. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Speaking about that, uh, how much do you think the security industry is still um, you know, biased towards uh, hiring computer science graduates uh, as opposed to people that are uh, self-taught in this uh, security field? I believe that in 10 or 15 years, colleges and universities will no longer exist. It, does it make sense, for example, to learn a science where you're taught by a human being with a limited brain and limited capacity when right here in your hands, you have access to the infinite knowledge of the world. I, I tell this to people all the time. They go, what should I study in school? I go, why do you want to go? I mean, if you want to go to school to, to party or to make friends or for social reasons, that's fine. Or you want a degree so that you can get a job with some structured company <coughs> that demands you have one, okay. But if you truly love what you do, you're not going to structure your life so from 10 a.m. till 11 a.m. you'll be studying um, uh, writing device drivers and then from 11 till 12 you'll be studying C++. No, that's nonsense. You're going to be living on the dark web. You're going to be living in, in these communities where people are talking about the ins and outs of, of technology. That's how you're going to learn. And those are the people I will hire. Because if software engineering and hacking is not a structured universe, it is very chaotic. And universities are very structured, even though they look chaotic and at fraternity parties. But um, so, so yeah, you, you, you need to question whether school in its current form will even exist. Um, from MGT Capital Investments' uh, point of view, um, what are you looking at exactly when deciding if you will invest or not in a tech company? Well, recently we've been investing mostly in ourselves because we have such a, a team of hackers, and and you know while while I'm off, you know looking for for possible new acquisitions, they're they're back creating things, you know, and and when I get back, there'll be something else they will have created. And that's how we came out with the Sentinel product and a, a whole bunch of other products. So, uh, you know, even, even in my world of, of investing and, and creating uh, cybersecurity products, uh, 
there are no rules. The world is, is changing rapidly. The thing that, that motivates me is that I, I see we as, as a world, not just a nation or, or class of people, but the entire world is teetering on the edge of a cliff, dangerously, where we are allowing these devices to basically become our masters rather than the other way around. And these devices are spy devices. We buy them so they can spy on us. And that's creating a great deal of danger. And at the same time, nation states are creating weaponized software that can destroy another nation's power grid. Well, I'd, I'd rather have nuclear bombs dropped because they're localized. If you lose a power grid for a nation, you will be living in a cave within a year, wearing animal skins, because that's the, there is no other hope. You cannot, you have no emergency services, no communication, no food, because all food production is automated. Without power, you cannot run the computers to automate that production. Without power, you can't run the machines, even if you had the manual capability of doing it. You can't distribute the food because that is all automated. It would be a horrific world, and yet we are all in this world, and at least a dozen nations have that button now. Russia, China, U.S., I know for sure. Isn't that frightening? It is. It should be waking people up, but instead we're still drawn into this tiny little colorful entertaining screen. Um, by the way, from all the devices that we as regular people are using, what's the least secure from all, from our, if we, if we were to choose between our smartphones? I can tell you what the most secure is, it's, it's this one, the one <laughs> that I carry, and it's the Samsung S7. And the reason is it is the only phone that cannot be remotely rooted or remotely jailbroken. All iPhones can be, be, be I, you know, again, whatever. Um, <laughs> The, so most hackable, the most hackable phone in the world is the iPhone. Android is second. Um, but before they can do anything, they have to root your phone remotely, meaning they've got a, you download a piece of software which roots your phone. And no matter how hard manufacturers have tried, no one has kept a remote rooting uh, uh, software out for more than a few months. This has gone for over a year. No one yet has, has developed one. So when they develop a root device for this, I'll search for something else. That's the only way, by the way, I can survive handing out my phone number and email address and inviting hackers to come and hack me. They can put the software on here, but the software is powerless until the phone is rooted. I never root it. Mr. McAfee, thank you so much for your time. It was uh, a pleasure. Now, if you're still uh, uh, available for uh, five or six minutes, I think that we can take one or two questions from uh, people yes, that gather absolutely. here. Uh, and we have some questions on Facebook uh, as well. Someone is asking uh, why you didn't win the presidential elections. <laughs> uh, well, I had no intention of winning it. I mean, <laughs> please, anybody, anybody who's 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 Googled me will know that I can never be the U.S. president. <laughs> well. Um, okay, no, but let's get real. Let's get real. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm smart enough to know that, and so were all the people on my campaign. However, what did it do? It allowed me to have a national platform to stand on, to tell people what I've just told you. Cybersecurity is our biggest risk. We're teetering on a cliff. If any of you have children, you'll understand what it means to want to leave the world in a better place than you found it. Well, I, we're about to leave a disaster to our children. I don't want that. No parent wants that. So it gave me a national stage, and especially me being John McAfee, expecting me to do something crazy, which I tried to do as often as possible. Um, people listen. But no, I, why I didn't win, there's no way I could have won. Ask that person what drugs they're on <laughs> for even asking okay. that question. I, I'm joking. Okay. I know. <laughs> we have one question there, I think. Yes. Uh, hi. Uh, when you were talking about uh, giving your data to someone for safekeeping. I'm sorry? When you were talking about giving your data to someone for safekeeping and filtering and whatnot, your 
personal data you know? yes I, I got this crazy idea traditionally uh, antiviruses uh, work like this you would install them on your computer you would maybe pay a license on them and hope they protect you but if that didn't happen uh, then you were screwed and you couldn't sue a company or something like this what if uh, we change a little the paradigm say i'm the consumer there's the hacker but there's a third party which is someone responsible for my security meaning okay i have all this personal data and i want to legally bind you to take care of it and not let anyone uh, get their hands on it if that happens you have to pay a lot of money <coughs> to me yes and in return for this maybe i pay a monthly fee of depends on the data on well, absolutely, but, the, the, but here's the problem. It requires that you act responsibly too, meaning that you will not download an application from Google Play or, or some other thing without reading what the permissions are that it's asking, or that you never visit a pornography site, or that you never visit any site that offers you something for free, which you know is not free. No, no, but, but, but here's the issue, because once, you, once your phone is then compromised, he can't, the, the third party can no longer be responsible because the hacker is not coming in this way, he's coming in pretending to be you. Yes, Do you understand? I understand, but in my uh, scenario, uh, if I'm the dumb client and I don't want to have responsibility, I want to delegate responsibility, this would mean that the third party, they, they should be proactive. They should go to the pornography websites and try all the things that I do, right, as a customer. But, but that's fine, and they can do that. Yeah. But, but as long as you are still using your phone, because, let me ask you this, how will you get access to your data? Are you going to drive to their building and sit down in front of their computer, or are going to use your computer to access your data? I'm going to use my device. So that's right, and your phone. device is the, is, the, is the Trojan horse. Your device is the, is the hole in the system, as long as you don't act responsibly. And if you're going to act responsibly, why do you need some third person to hold your data? That's, that's, that's the catch-22 here, is that it has to be on our shoulders. We always want to put responsibility on someone else's shoulders. Well, that has never worked for anything in my life. Uh, and, and it works least of all in cybersecurity. But, but that's, that's just my humble opinion. So, Thank you so much. Thank you so welcome. much. In the United States, copyright law allows for the fair use of copyrighted material under certain limited circumstances without the prior permission from the owner. Under the law, determinations of fair use take into account the purpose of the use, the nature of the copyrighted work, the amount and substantiality of the work used in relation to the work as a whole, and the effect of the use upon the potential market for the copyrighted work. Other jurisdictions may have similar copyright provisions protecting fair use or fair dealing. If you are uncertain as to whether a specific use qualifies as a fair use, you should consult a qualified copyright attorney. You have the right to take it down.